scripture today is Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Friends, listen to what these words would say to us today. I think that one needs a prayer too. It's been a couple of rough parables in, the, in a row. Will you join me in prayer? God, may our words and our thoughts and our reflections be a blessing to you this day and always. Amen. This is not related, and I had, anyway, there's a Facebook group for the narrative lectionary, which is what we are traveling on, and it, it came up with a couple of posts about how the preachers are not happy about this parable. Perhaps they hate it, in fact, and we're not excited about this Sunday morning, because it's a weird one. And it's kind of upsetting. It is the first of the of three finale kingdom parables that Jesus gives and tells his disciples before his death. We are in the timeline after Palm Sunday, which we'll get to, and before Jesus' death, in that week in between. It starts here, where it's a little wonky, but I'm telling you, next week we're going to end with the third one. It's a banger. Come back. Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine gave some advice uh, to preachers about preaching parables, and I thought it might be useful for all of those who study as well. She said, Jewish parables, which would include Jesus's parables, are very rarely about God. They are about people, so don't over-spiritualize them. And two, there is often no meaning or point. The parable is supposed to make you ask questions, to notice your reaction, and to drive conversation with those in your reading community, your study worship community. It is a starting line toward revelation. It is not the revelation itself. AJ, as she goes by, as if we're good close personal friends, would advise against looking for the moral of the parable that one piece that you can pull out that is simple and clear about what the meaning and the purpose is for our lives. Instead, we are supposed to look for the truth. The truth about what it is to be human, to live on this earth in this body. The truth of what it is, is, what it is to be made in the image of God and how we learn to live in community together community together that is the kingdom of God. And sometimes truth is complicated, as complicated as humanity is. But morals of stories won't set us free. Truth will. Now, 
I am a planner-ish. Mostly I'm a catastrophizer, which means I will see all of the problems and the worst case scenarios and I would like to be ready just in case. I also worked in youth ministry and so that involved like middle school children, boys, and it, you, you, and you need to be prepared. So I'm also, a, I'm also a people pleaser. So I like to make sure I have all the things that someone might need in case of an emergency. I have things. Do you need hand lotion? Hand sanitizer? Chapstick? Don't share it. It's kind of gross, guys. Do you need a snack? Do you need a cell phone charger? Not Apple. We don't do Apple around here. Do you need a lint roller? <laughs> Eye drops? A hair tie? I mean, you see my point. Um, and lots of people mock me for my giant bag that's really heavy, and they're like, maybe that's why your back hurts all the time. And then they're like, oh my god, I need a Band-Aid. And I'm like, I got a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. Early on when Kelly and I were dating, I would carry my giant purse with all of my things that I absolutely needed. And then one day she said, do you have any floss? And I didn't. I do now. <laughs> but I was missing that one thing I needed in the moment. When I was much younger, I prided myself on my spiritual readiness, on my scriptural knowledge, on my certainty that I was right, on my ability to interpret a parable and find its moral that you would pull out for your life on how good I could be or how long or well I could pray. But friends, there is always somebody who can pray longer or better or seems to get all of the best blessings. There were also times when I had nothing left. These were the times when I had no answers for life's hard questions, no answers to prayer, no prayers for me to give, no certainty. It was a time when I was full of doubt. And it wasn't the only time, and it wasn't the last time, and these times rolled through every now and then when I completely run out of oil. There have been times when I have been the bridesmaid who is so well prepared, so certain, the bridesmaid with all of the extra oil and things, and there have been times when I have been the bridesmaid whose light is growing dim in the darkness of midnight. Here's the thing about these bridesmaids. We're told five were wise and five were foolish. But it's not really uh -oh. it's not really clear why one of them, why the ones called foolish are foolish. I know what you're gonna say, it's because they didn't bring the extra oil, but that's not really clear. We're just told they're foolish and they didn't bring the oil. Might be the reason. It might just be a set of information that we have. And we aren't really told why the wise ones were wise and we assume it's because they brought the extra oil and they were pre prepared. But they responded in this time of need with a sense of fear and scarcity that they might not have enough just in case. So there wasn't enough for them to share, just in case. They deny the other five without. They deny them help. And they send them away, knocking on the doors in the darkness. And it doesn't take us long to come up with a lot of solutions that would not have involved waking up half the town to find oil. They could have buddy systemed arm in arm. They could have just waited for the groom to arrive. 
He was seen from a distance, so he must have had some kind of light. They could have waited for his light. But the five with the extra oils, best idea was to send them away. And this parable is told by Jesus, who has also said earlier in this in this gospel, give to anyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. And even so, we call these five bridesmaids wise. We kind of do that today. We valorize those who have more than enough. We put them on the cover of magazines and celebrate that they were able to acquire more, possibly by withholding from others in need. Our social medias are filled with influencers who seem to have it all figured out. They're living picture perfect lives, lives in which they would never have to run out in the middle of the night to buy dinner or diapers or oil for lamp, who say in explicit or subtle ways and tell us that we are not enough and we are not measuring up. Maybe what made these five foolish was that they listened to the lies that they needed to be more or better than who they were to begin with. Maybe that's why they were foolish. Maybe why they were foolish was because they didn't trust that the groom and the bride would welcome them into their celebration as friends, regardless of their fading lamps. Maybe that's why they were called foolish, because they left. Maybe they were foolish because they did not see the blessing of the darkness. They quickly moved in fear and scarcity instead of staying put in faith and hope of abundance. They weren't the first ones in our Bible to listen to the lies and feel shamed about who they were. That privilege goes to Eve and to Adam. But they weren't the last either. That carries through generations to us today. And it will be said by one of the followers of Jesus very soon after he dies by his follower Paul, if you think that you are wise in this age, then you should become foolish so that you may be wise for the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. What if, what if there is not a single wise person in this story? at least not by the standards of God's kingdom. Because the five with the extra oil held on to it and sent the other five into the night with the hellish experience of having to knock on strangers' doors begging for oil. Scrambling in the darkness, missing the moments the ones with extra oil were called to be their sister's keepers, and out of fear, out of scarcity, out of arrogance, they were not. They missed the opportunity to be the beloved community to one another, and so they missed seeing God arrive into their community and celebrate what they had done and show them that love. And I wonder what would have happened if those five foolish bridesmaids had stayed. What if they had waited in the honesty of the darkness, had spent a little time in that uncomfortable place and waited on the groom, who let's say, despite what A.J. Levine would say, let's say it's Jesus. And the groom would meet them there, exactly where they were, with more than enough light and more than enough grace and more than enough welcome to embrace 
them as they were in that moment, even with their lamps a little dimmed. In their struggle, in their pain, in their brokenness, they ran until they could do, could knock on the door correctly or perfectly when they just needed to be there, to be honest about their fading light and be honest to the one who brings the light and would meet them and share it, shine for them. All they needed to do was stay put. Our stories, there through our stories in the Bible, reveal a God who met people in wilderness and in darkness and on the road between who they were and who they were becoming. It is Jacob fleeing from his past, meeting the divine on the road and being given a new name. And Moses, who had made himself small, met God on a mountaintop to make his call big. It is Nicodemus under the, call, under the cover of darkness giving, given words of new life. And what if, when the bridesmaids had knocked on the door after they had gone away, after they had tried so hard to hide their true selves, to be someone else, what if that's what made them unrecognizable? What if the voice that they heard coming through the door wasn't one of anger, but one of sorrow. Like, I don't even know who you are anymore. A parable is just a story that tells us a little about the, how, the, how the world is and how the world is to come. It's about people, and it's about us, and it's meant to invoke something in us to tell us something about how we see ourselves and, the, and others and our communities. And we are invited to find ourselves in these stories. Because haven't we each been one of these characters at different points in our lives? Maybe different points in the same day? Haven't we been those who are worn out? Whose lights are flickering low? whose oil is running out, who are full of doubt or brokenness or shame or fear, trying to make ourselves into something that would be acceptable, forgetting that we already are. Haven't we all thought a lot of ourselves when things are going well, that we've done well, and we've judged others for not using their bootstraps correctly to pull themselves up? Haven't we held on tightly to scarcity, in, in our fear of scarcity? Haven't sometimes we been the groom in the story, refusing to make space for others? So maybe, in the end, that's all that a good parable and story does. They allow us to find ourselves in it, all of our warts, all of our imperfections. They leave us to ask questions and to reshape the world around us. So, beloveds, if you find yourselves feeling like a foolish bridesmaid, remember, you are enough. Remember to wait in the darkness and don't run from it. Even the darkness is a holy place and God will meet you there. And if you find yourself feeling like the wise bridesmaid, remember to share what you have, even if that scares you. Give yourself the chance to be in a holy place, to build community and know that God will meet you there. And while we kind of ignore it, sidestep the bridegroom there. If you find yourself feeling like the groom, remember to open wide the doors of the banquet feast and welcoming all of those who have made mistakes and who have walked in darkness to every holy place. 
and that the darkness itself is holy. And know that God will meet you there. Beloveds, God will meet us here and outside of our doors and in every moment. Amen. As we sing our next song, the other way this sermon goes is to keep your lamps trimmed and burning. It is uh, an African-American slave got him. Uh, and so how do you prepare for the day that your freedom is coming, when someone is coming to liberate you from your enslavement? You are always, always ready and prepared, even if it's not today. That's the other story.